So the AI code editor wars have uh, just gone to a completely new level. It feels like almost overnight. Yeah, it really does. For the past couple of years, we've all been focused on, you know, getting chatbots and inline completions working inside our IDEs. Which is helpful, don't get me wrong. Yeah. But it's still a workflow where the human is doing all the driving. We're the main engine. Exactly. And then Google just walks right into the middle of all of this with a product called Anti-Gravity. And the material we're looking at today makes it crystal clear this is something different. It's a total paradigm shift. Their whole pitch is that this is an IDE where, and I'm quoting here, the main character is not the editor, it is the agent. Okay, so that's a big claim. And that's what we need to unpack. We want to figure out what anti-gravity really is, how it works, and you know how it stacks up against something people already use, like Cursor. And the big question, right, is this the actual future of writing software? Or is it just another cool project that's going to end up on the Killed by Google memorial wall? Let's get into it. Let's start with that fundamental shift. Your traditional AI tool, it's there to help you type faster. Right, to reduce friction. Exactly. but. Anti-gravity is designed to reduce the friction of thinking. It's an IDE built around three core surfaces. You've got an editor, which feels a lot like VS Code. Okay, familiar territory. Then you have the agent manager, which is basically mission control. And then the really interesting part, an integrated browser that the agent can actually use by itself. All right, let's break that down because the agent first idea is the key. Hmm. We're not talking about asking it to, you know, write this function for me anymore. No, not at all. The idea is you give it a full mission, a high level goal, something like build me a flight tracker that syncs to my Google Calendar. And it's supposed to just figure out the steps, the tools, everything. That's the goal. It has to figure out all the steps. It's the difference between line level help and task level help. Okay, what do you mean by that? Line level versus task level. Well, traditional tools help you on the line you're currently writing. They're constantly interrupting your flow in a way. Anti-gravity tries to get out of your way. So it works in the background. It works in the background and then comes back to you at a natural checkpoint. It groups its thinking into these structured artifacts. Mm -hmm. Things like task lists or implementation plans. So instead of scrolling through a giant chat log trying to figure out what it did. Right. You're reviewing a formal report from a colleague. It's a much higher level interaction. It can look at your mission and say, OK, first I need a database migration. Then I need this utility. Then I can touch the fun end. That sounds incredibly efficient. Yeah. But I have to ask, does this just trade one job for another? Am I spending less time coding and more time managing the robot? That is a totally fair question. Uh -huh. And the answer is supposed to be in the agent manager. That's your mission control. Okay. From there, you can launch and supervise multiple agents at once. So you could have one agent doing some uh, long-term architecture research for a new feature. A slow burn task. A slow burn task, exactly. And at the same time, you could tell another agent, hey, go clean up all the old tests in this other part of the code base. And you're not seeing all the nitty gritty details of what they're doing. No, the manager filters all that noise. You just see these human readable summaries like researching aviation APIs or refactoring test suite. You stay at that high level. Okay, so that's the manager. What about the editor itself? You said it's like a fork of VS Code. It is, but it's augmented to work with the agent. So instead of basic autocomplete, you get things like super complete. Super complete. Yeah, it suggests complex edits across the whole file, not just the next word. It might propose changing a function signature and all of its call sites at once. And I saw something in here about tab to jump. What's that about? Is the agent trying to control my cursor? It kind of is, but in a helpful way. It's about reducing context switching. So if you just wrote a function that needs, say, a new state definition at the top of the file. I don't have to scroll up and find it. Exactly. You just hit tab, and it jumps your cursor to the next logical place you need to edit. It anticipates the structure of your code. That's clever. But I think the third surface, the browser. Yeah. That's where things get really wild. Oh, absolutely. This is where the autonomy really takes off. The agent doesn't just write the code. It can spin up a local dev server. On its own. On its own. It opens your app in its own dedicated Chrome profile. And then it starts clicking buttons, filling in forms, scrolling, basically testing the application like a human would. And it records this. It records the entire session, screenshots, video, everything. And it attaches that recording to its final report, the walkthrough artifact. So it's not just saying, I'm done. It's saying, I'm done, and here's the video proof that it works. Precisely. That changes everything for trust. You're reviewing proof, not just a promise. Let's make this more concrete. 
The source material had this great hands-on demo, the Flight Tracker project. Yeah, that's the perfect example. The developer gives it a single, simple prompt. What was it? Something like, build a flight lookup, next.js web app. User enters a flight number, they see the start and end time, time zones, origin, destination, and use a mock API for now. That's it. And from just that one sentence? The agent takes over completely. It runs create next app to scaffold the project. It generates an implementation plan for the human to review and approve. So you get a chance to course correct it early. Right. You can say, no, use this naming convention or let's prioritize this part first. Once you approve it, it writes the code, starts the dev server, and then uses that built-in browser to test it. And this is where that phrase Gemini 3 coding comes in, right? Uh, it means more than just text. It means multimodal reasoning because the agent doesn't just stop at the mock API. It can go out and research a real one like Aviation Stack. It'll read the documentation. The actual web page. The actual web page. Then it can run curl commands with an API key you provide. It'll generate a proper utility module to wrap that API. And you got a whole markdown file explaining how it all works. So my job as a developer, it just completely changes. I'm not writing boilerplate anymore. I'm reviewing plans and polishing the last 10%. You're an editor, as a director. And to do that effectively, the agent needs context way beyond the file you have open. Which brings us to this idea of the model context protocol or MCP. Right, and knowledge items. Okay, but we've all heard better context promises from AI tools before. Why is this any different? The difference is that it's structured and it's live. MCP isn't just about indexing your code base. It allows the agent to talk directly to external systems. Like what? Like it can connect to a Neon or Supabase database and pull the live schema. It can connect to Linear to get the context of the issue ticket you're working on, GitHub for the repo structure. So if my database schema changes while the agent is working. It knows. It requeries the schema and self-corrects the code it's writing before it gives it to you. That's the part that's different. It's resilient to the real world changing. That's a huge deal. And what about the knowledge items? You said that's like long-term memory. Right, exactly. It's where the agent can store patterns. So if your company has a rule that every file needs a specific license header. You only have to teach it once. You teach it once right. and that becomes a knowledge item. From then on, it just applies that rule automatically across all projects. It's yeah. building up genuine institutional knowledge. The whole ecosystem sounds incredibly powerful. Uh -huh. But let's get to the real world comparison, the one everyone is asking. How does this stack up against Cursor? Yeah, the daily driver for so many people right now, I think the main difference is their core philosophy. How so? Cursor is centered on its composer and its inline chat. You're still driving the car, but Cursor is this amazing co-pilot helping you navigate. Okay, and anti-gravity. Anti-gravity is you setting the destination in the GPS and letting the car drive itself. You're just reviewing the itinerary it proposes. It's about the agent manager, not the chat box. What about pure autonomy? Purser is fantastic at writing and refactoring code within the code base, but for those mm -hmm. really complex flows, you know, setting up a server, running tests, you still have to provide the glue. The manual steps. The manual steps. Anti-gravity handles the server, the browser, and the recorded walkthroughs. It's a much more end-to-end -end autonomous system. But there's a catch, right? There's always a trade-off with new, ambitious tech. Oh, for sure. The user experience, cursor is polished, it's fast, it's stable. Anti-gravity, by all accounts, is still pretty fragile. What are people running into? Quota limits that seem to come out of nowhere, agents that just stall silently, and yeah. the big one this infamous spinning login wheel when you first try to install it. So bottom line, should developers switch today? The practical answer is probably not, not entirely. Most power users will likely keep both for a while. So cursor for the day-to-day -day work. Exactly. It wins on reliability and just a smoother UI. Think of anti-gravity as your experimental lab. It wins on pure agent autonomy and depth, but you have to be ready for it to break. For those who do want to jump into that lab, let's talk about that spinning wheel. That login loop sounds infuriating. What are the fixes? Yeah, the fixes are weirdly specific, which tells you it's still an early product. On Windows, users report you have to install it on your C drive. Seriously? Seems to be a file permission thing. And the other big one is you need to set Chrome as your default browser. The browser agent is just deeply tied to it. Good to know. Okay, let's pivot to the business side of things. This much power has to cost something. You'd think so, but right now it's a free public preview for individuals. Free? 
with access to top tier models. Yep, you get Gemini 3 Pro, Claude Sonnet 4.5, GPT style models. The access is there. But there has to be a catch. The catch is the rate limits. They're generous in theory, but they're not based on a simple prompt count. They're based on amount of work. What does that mean in practice? It means a quick edit is cheap. But telling an agent to build a whole project, run a server, and test it in a browser, that costs a lot. And it feels very unpredictable to the user when they're going to hit that wall. Right, which makes it hard to rely on for anything mission critical. It and, of course, we have to talk about trust. The... Uh... The killed by Google factor, that's a huge shadow over any new product from them. It's a massive hurdle. The terms of service are pretty clear that they collect interactions to improve the product. And interactions could mean anything. It could mean my proprietary code. It could. There's a telemetry toggle, but the ambiguity is enough to make a lot of companies with sensitive IP just say, no thanks for now. Uh -huh. You really have to think about your threat model before you feed it your crown jewels. Before we wrap this all up, Let's nail down some concrete use cases. Mm. Where does anti-gravity really, truly shine today? Okay, number one, greenfield web apps. It's incredible at scaffolding, setting up routing, basic styling, and running those initial tests. It gets you from zero to a working prototype faster than anything I've seen. Makes sense. What else? API integration, it's perfect for that. It can read the docs, hit the live endpoints, and generate all the client-side code for you. That's a huge time saver. And you mentioned onboarding. Yeah, legacy code base mapping. Uh -huh. Imagine telling a new hire, just ask the agent to crawl this repo and generate an architecture report. It can create diagrams and summaries that would take a human weeks to figure out. It dramatically cuts down ramp up time. So bringing it all together, what's the final take? I think the advice is pretty simple. If you're a conservative developer, if you value stability above all else, stick with Cursor. It's a fantastic tool. But if you're curious... If you're curious about what the next five years of software development might look like, you have to install anti-gravity. Give it a real mission. And honestly, watch where it fails. Seeing where the agent gets stuck is almost as insightful as seeing where it succeeds. That's a great point. It feels like the long-term takeaway here is that the conversation is shifting. We're not going to be arguing about which autocomplete is a few milliseconds faster. No, the new skill will be learning how to manage and direct these agents that can design, implement, and even document whole systems on their own. So as we close out, here's the thought to leave you with. If your job is changing from someone who types code to someone who reviews implementation plans and test results, what are the skills you need to build right now to be an effective agent manager in this new world?